Hey everyone, welcome to week 61. This is day four, this is Thursday. This is our fourth day of our ongoing One Small Brush week. And the brush has been great. I think we're gonna retire the brush after uh, this week because it does take a beating. It's a pretty uh, cheap brush. It's a Lion Deluxe brush, which means quality. <laughs> so it has taken a beating, it's splayed, uh, but it's gonna be good for this week, I think. And, and I think we've been doing uh, pretty well. So. Let's see how we do today. Okay, let's get started. Uh, this is day four. This is our fourth day of our one small brush week. And I think we've been doing pretty well, or maybe fine, because uh, the actual painting of the paintings, the actual making of the paintings, it's quite strenuous, I would say. Uh, physically, I can feel it. I think I spoke about this on Monday, on the first day, and my hand just really cramps up. You know, my hand feels like it's painting differently. Not only my brain, like my brain is trying to make sense of how to configure a large image or a larger image, let's say better, um, based upon small relationships. And like I said, for me, this kind of goes against my nature, against my philosophy in painting. So it does feel like I'm trudging through the painting and it makes me feel hyper focused, I guess. You know, I have to be on top of every single decision that I make in my painting, even more so. And I think I'm far more lenient when I'm very excited about blocking in with big shapes and big brushes. Those initial maybe 20, 40 minutes or, you know, the first hour of a painting where I really do feel like I'm attacking the painting, where I'm just trying to be very, very expressive and I'm trusting I would say my instincts. I think that the experiences that I've gathered throughout these years, they have shaped my instinct in some way. They have constructed the way I can react in a painting. And I fully trust that. I'm at a point where I think I'm comfortable enough with my painting where I can trust it. Now, what does that mean that I can trust those instincts? It means that I know I'm going to be off. I for sure know that when I'm being expressive, I'm actually putting a lot of weight in this balance where there should be equilibrium, but I'm sacrificing that balance in order to put everything into expressiveness, in order to let myself just freely establish a painting. It is much more important for me to establish the bigger sense of a painting, the atmosphere that envelops a painting. To me, in my hierarchical scale, that sits at the top. And in order for me to access that, I kind of let myself mess up. You know, I'm, I'm totally aware that I'm going to make countless of mistakes, most of them of drawing nature. I'm positive, I'm quite positive that I'm not going to hit my drawing. This is something that I know is going to be off, but I'm okay with it. I've learned how to be okay with it. I've taught myself throughout the years to know that it's okay. I'm going to be able to go back and fix or adjust a lot of those things or maybe use those things. Sometimes I'm surprised by my own mistakes because I don't see them as mistakes anymore. I see them as having potential. I see them as doors to possibilities. So I've learned how to navigate what I originally considered errors and I've understood them now as just freedom, absolute freedom to explore new realms within my painting. And I love that. So I feel very, very comfortable when I can attack a painting. It's like I'm loose, I'm absolutely loose. When I have a small brush in my hand, my whole body just knows it. My whole body understands that this is something different, that I can't really spark the same emotions that I am able to when I use the tools that I traditionally use to start a painting, to begin a painting. That's been the hardest part, just to tell my body that even though my body is feeling different, even though what is going on is just objectively different, I have to tell myself, we are going for the same things that are relevant, though. We are trying to get to a place where the essence of my own painting is not being sacrificed because of the tools, because I do have to feel like the same painter. And this is super, super important. I do have to understand myself as a single integral painter. It doesn't matter what tools I use. It doesn't matter the colors. It doesn't matter the brands. It doesn't matter the size of the brush. It doesn't matter the substrate. It doesn't matter. And I have to teach myself exactly that, that it doesn't matter. 
And I know that these are things that we can brush off and we can just say, yeah, sure, it doesn't matter. And we can try and convince ourselves that they don't. But when we are put in a situation where all these variables are different and where we feel uncomfortable, like I say, where we feel physically uncomfortable, you know, many times we just go like, no, these are not the conditions for me to paint. I need to feel safe. I need to feel like I'm surrounded by the tools that I know. I need to feel that this is an environment that I can control. And if it's not that, I can't paint. I'm not going to enjoy painting. And I think that, you know, what I put myself through time and time and time again is teaching me that painting goes beyond this idea of enjoyment. Eventually, I realized that the enjoyment comes from just feeling this immense connection with painting, with something that's broader than brands of color or saturated hues or expensive brushes or really nice pieces of linen. You know, none of those things matter. Deep down, when I search inside, I realize that they don't. I realize that by letting those go, by not being beholden to those variables, what I've taught myself is that I can trust myself and that I can trust the relationship that I've constructed with painting and that even though it's not something that I'm used to doing with my own painting practice, if there comes a time where I need to adjust, where I need to be flexible, where I need to put myself in a situation where I have to learn, you know, at a moment's notice how to adjust my painting, I'm going to be willing and able to do it. And I don't think we can teach ourselves those things if we don't put ourselves in uncomfortable situations. It's impossible. It's impossible to abstractly say, yeah, I should be able to do that if we never do it. That's why I think I adore exercises in painting where I strip away the expectations of painting. I don't really understand painting as being something I don't try to visualize it as something before it's done, or I don't try to impose historical definitions of what a painting is supposed to look like, or the manner in which it is supposed to be socialized, or the degree of development that a painting should have. None of those things I am beholden to. I try to teach myself to not understand painting in any of those terms. I always try to tell myself, just start to paint have a willingness to paint at the beginning. You need that spark. And then just start to paint and, you know, be okay with navigating this painting and then just pay attention to your painting and let it lead you to wherever it wants to take you. And when you feel satisfied and when you feel that it is an experience that has given you enough elements that you can learn from, then you can say, I'm good for today. And maybe you pick it up the next day or maybe you just leave it like that. There's no reason why we should believe that a painting has to look, has to look a certain way. None of that is true. It's just that we've grown accustomed to seeing Western paintings in museums and to seeing how paintings are hung at all sorts of galleries and to seeing what sorts of paintings are socialized and commercialized. And if we want to belong to all these manners of showcasing and selling paintings, that's totally fine. That's absolutely fine, but we have to be aware of it. But that doesn't mean that that's it, that that's the wholeness of painting. No, there's a universe of painting that is completely unexplored. And it's unexplored because it actually depends and it can be shaped by every single individual that is painting right now. Every single painter is a painting force, is a vehicle in which painting can be redefined and represented to other people. We all have that potential. I truly, truly believe that. So we can carve our own way and we can do it through the aid of painting. Or we could say, no, I much rather just jump on this train, you know, that has all these tracks that are built already and that it has routes that I can travel through, places that are really nice that I can visit. I know that all these things have been constructed and placed here in front of me before I was even born. And this is just the way it is. And you can hop on that train and say, yep, this is my ride. And, you know, it can be the ride of your life. And that could be the way you experience painting. Or you can just say, I don't know. I don't really know where I'm headed and it's fine. It's okay. And you kind of teach yourself that not knowing is kind of cool. It doesn't have to be scary. I don't know why this idea of uncertainty has always been sold to us as something that's so foreign to our human nature that it should be avoided. 
you know, that it's actually harmful to us. We should be solid and aware and certain of everything that we're doing. We should plan for the future. And the reality is that maybe that's not the path for all of us. I could tell you this. I'm in a relationship. I think I'm in a really great relationship with Danny. We're both professionals. We're very best friends. Obviously, we love each other very much. I also have uh, two kids. You guys know this already, Samu and Fed. And there's a ton of things that are part of my life that I have to plan ahead and I have to be very conscious of. Most of them having to do with my kids or most of them having to do with the stability that I would love to have in my relationship with Danny. But there's other parts of my life where I just don't want to know what's going to happen. And a lot of that has to do with painting. I want painting to be exciting. I yearn to learn things every single day. There's no rush that feels the same as working on a painting where you're absolutely lost and you just claw your way out of it. And in the end, you just see the remnants of this battle and you have battle scars. I mean, you can't showcase the scar that you have across your eye, but they're inside and you go like, hell yeah, this was worth it. You know, you feel proud of yourself and it could be a losing effort. You know, it could totally be a losing effort. And those are harder to be okay with. But we can teach ourselves how to be cool with them also. We can be like, this was hell. You know, this was horrible. This was slow motion quicksand. And I knew I was going to be swallowed by this thing. And it was absolutely painful. But as soon as you're done, you tell yourself, it's over. And tomorrow, I'm up for the battle again. I'm up for it. Like, this made me stronger. You know, these defeats, they can't make you weaker. This is not about having a, a winning or losing record. None of those things matter. You know, you could do a thousand bad paintings. It doesn't matter. If they lead you to that moment where you feel like you connected with something, you have to be grateful for those thousands of bad paintings that are behind you. Because if it wasn't for them, you wouldn't be there. You wouldn't. There's no shortcuts. So I love not knowing. I love feeling like every single day I just put like a little brick on this road and I have no idea where I'm headed. I'm not going to Emerald City. It's not like I can see it in the distance and I'm like, okay, I got to build this yellow brick road. No, no, no. I don't see anything because in some way I can't see past anything. I think that if I try to see past what I'm doing today, I'm not going to learn every single thing that I can from today. I'm not going to be able to extract all the knowledge that I can extract from today. So I have to be so present and I have to be so willing to put everything I am into today's painting that there's no point in trying to look further. Today's painting has to feel like this is the last painting I'm going to paint. This could be the last painting I'm going to paint. So make it worth it. Put your whole soul into it. Be vulnerable, you know, in front of it. Grant yourself the chance to really manifest yourself through that painting. I think yesterday's painting was a beautiful encounter, re-encounter with uh, the human body. Again, thanks to Adrian. You know, without his generosity, I couldn't have done that painting. It was very nice to connect again with this appreciation, this beautiful idea I have of the human body. So I was reminded of an etching. I mean, I could have been reminded of like Bontormo or Andrea del Sarto or all these like mannerist painters that did uh, highly gestural serpentine poses. Uh, but I was reminded of an etching, uh, Mariano Fortuni etching, that I really, really like. And I love the elongated kind of twisting shape of that torso. And, you know, it's one of those things that you go like, oh, last week we were talking about connecting with George's work, uh, George Pratt. And today, you know, I'm not Mariano Fortuni. I'll never come close to one of the most virtuoso painters ever, ever. Mariano Fortuny has to be one of the artists in all of art history that has the highest natural ability that you could ever have. He was gifted. He was extraordinary. He was born a star. There's no other way about it. That's unfortunately not true for, you know, the rest of us. So we have to work our asses off just to be able to put ourselves in a situation where we can one day say, oh, I was reminded, <laughs> you know, through a painting of this wonderful Mariano Fortuny etching and I tried to evoke a lot of the teachings that I gathered from that particular etching. And I think that etching actually helped me contextualize what I've been speaking about throughout this whole week, which is smallness. Um, I started the week by saying, you know, one of the most talented painters ever is Joaquin Sorolla. And I think that that's undeniable. I really do. 
I hate to sound definitive when I speak about painting, but Joaquin Sorolla, come on. I mean, he is one of the most talented painters ever, period. Uh, Velázquez, he's probably the best painter ever, period. Not my favorite painter. That gold medal goes to Rembrandt, but that's just me. There's no wrong answers here. If you said Rubens, that's fine. If you said Van Dyck, that's fine. If you said Velázquez, that's fine. If you said Van Eyck, that's fine. I say Rembrandt. But anyways, so these people, are, I think, are objectively geniuses. And both Velázquez and Sorolla teach us about the bigness of things, the wholeness, the integrity of things, being faithful to the largeness of nature, to understanding the small features of nature, the specific qualities of nature, not as something important in themselves, but as being part of a bigger whole, of a bigger idea. So that's their lesson. And that's the lesson I've chosen to follow. That's the path that I've chosen to follow. It is from that truth that I've started to construct my own path, that I've started to carve my own journey. So speaking of Fortuny, imagine my amazement when I saw that small painting of that kid just lying on the grass that I've told you guys about. You know, this is one of my top five paintings ever. I think it's one of the most beautiful paintings I'll ever see in my life. I think that I can live for 40 more years and I'm pretty sure that that painting is still going to be there. I think it's set in stone for me at least. So imagine if I held these things to be true and suddenly I see this painting that is executed in such a masterful way, but it's so small and precious. It is so absolutely precious that it just scrambles my brain. After seeing that painting, I was like, what am I supposed to like now? What is this? You know, this turned everything upside down. Because I, like I've said before, and if you guys have traveled to Madrid, to Museo del Prado, you guys know that that painting is hanging alongside some of the largest and most gorgeous 19th century paintings that you'll ever, ever see. I mean, it's amongst these historical painters that are giants. Giants. I mean, this is the peak of naturalist painting. And I thought that this tiny postcard of a painting was able to eclipse everything in those rooms. Every time I see it, it casts such a big shadow that it's impossible to see all those other paintings. So this is one of those moments in my life where I'm like, what is real now? What am I supposed to believe now? I thought I loved something. I understood something to be true, but this is something totally different. What am I supposed to do with this? How does that impact my painting? What do my paintings look like now? And the gorgeous thing about painting is that you don't have to have a team. It's not like your team Raphael or team Titian. It's not like your team Ang or team Delacroix. You know, you don't have to pick sides. It doesn't matter. You can like everything. I've always spoken about this. You can like Bouguereau and you can like Franz Klein. Those do not exclude each other. They speak about painting and painting comes from a single source. So it's pointless to just say, yeah, but these are the ways in which they're different. Yeah, but that's just us human beings that are so annoying and we feel so proud in pointing out how everything is different, how all the things can be different. And we choose not to see how all these things actually are connected, how these paintings can share a ton of DNA. Now we actually choose and feel proud to say, no, they're very different. And we want to feel we're in the right side of painting. We don't want to be on the wrong side of painting. I've taught myself how to enjoy painting, and honestly, I feel that that has made me stronger. So I'm always going to push people to just bring some of those biases down and let yourself enjoy painting. And I think in my case with Fortuny, that's what I kind of had to do. I had to tell myself I can be about the bigness, even though, if I have to be honest, Fortuny would do very small paintings, but they feel colossal. Like, you would never believe that the paintings are physically the size that they are. If you saw reproductions of them, and if I told you they were 10 times bigger, you would say, yeah, I could see that. So in his case, there was still a philosophy of trying to achieve bigness, which only made him more extraordinary that he could do that with tiny brushes on a tiny painting. It's absolutely incredible. So I do think that there's a ton of things that are shared between those huge historical paintings and this tiny little Fortuny painting. I really do feel that they are in the end very much so connected. So I think that for today's painting, I'm trying to put all these lessons together and I'm trying to understand, for example, why is it that I'm isolating the painting that is being configured by all these sort of floating strokes? 
you know, why am I doing this? Why am I leaving this paper that I'm working on, my substrate, untouched? You know, what is it about that sense of not having this obligation to just cover all this space that is surrounding the subject of my painting that I'm enjoying and that I've recognized as something that works? I think I touched upon it on Tuesday, but I think it just amplifies the idea of making choices, putting something down, committing to it, and then moving along. And I tell myself while I'm painting, you know, I could just cover the whole painting up. But that's something that becomes just this physical labor. You know, it's the act of covering everything up. But it doesn't mean anything. As soon as I establish in certain areas of the painting with the relationship that I want, you know, for example, today, the relationship I want my figure to have with the atmosphere that surrounds her, as soon as I establish that, I tell myself, I don't need to speak about more atmosphere. Like the relationship, the nature of the relationship is already there. That has been established. Why do I have to paint more? I don't have to paint more. I don't have to paint anything. And maybe, you know, paintings like these are mini homages to Maisonnier sketches and studies. Because, like I said at the beginning, I think studying is one of the most exciting things about painting. And perhaps I'm totally fine with that and that's all I want to do. I just want to study painting. That's going to be my road. That's going to be my journey and I'm totally okay with that. So I really enjoy how I'm surrendering to wherever my painting is taking me. Like I've always said, I'm glad to be along there for the ride. I am there enjoying my travels. It's like vacation time. It's like every day is a vacation. <laughs> Anyways, that's going to be it for today. Uh, join us tomorrow where we finish off this week. I think we can finish strong. I think we can go back to something a little bit smaller. Uh, also trying to configure a sense of wholeness through the uh, specificity of form. And I think I'm going to do that with the help of Danny. I've always told you guys I can close my eyes and I could paint Danny in my sleep, I feel. We'll see how we're going to do tomorrow. We'll see how we balance the painted decisions with the raw substrate. But I think that I'm going to be faithful to where the week has brought me. So we're probably going to see that beautiful relationship between paint and raw surface tomorrow also. But that's going to be tomorrow. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you for hanging out. Bye.